Greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to the Path Ahead webinar series. Our ep uh, episode today is called Montana Zoom Towns is Outdoor Recreation Access the New Gold Rush. I am so excited to talk about this topic and to have these guests with us and know that this is just the beginning of a discussion um, that we will have as we grow and change as a state and our, uh, in this time of COVID and post-COVID. So um, welcome our guests, uh, Christina Henderson from the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Uh, we'll have Marnie Hayes, who's the Executive Director of Montana Business, Business for Montana Outdoors and Erica Lighthizer um, from her <laughs> the place that we're not even gonna talk about traveling uh, with the Park County Environmental Council. Um, so to start with, um, we are going to take questions through the Q and A. Uh, if you, um, that's the best way to do it. If you have, we'll handle the questions at the end um, and we're really are all committed to trying to leave enough time to address those uh, questions that you have. Um, use the chat. And if you have trouble, uh, um, you can text this 406-200-8240 uh, if you're having trouble. So this um, series was the brain child of um, Rachel uh, Schmidt and myself um, because we realized that there, we really needed a platform for, to address the front lines of front country. So front country being developed recreation. Um, we, uh, we hosted a <clears throat> recreation innovation lab and business of outdoor recreation summits over the last few years and have taken the, the lessons that we all have to learn and share um, to Zoom as many uh, um, others have. And um, we are um, gonna wrangle this topic today uh, the best we can. Um, so <clears throat> today I'll review the key takeaways briefly. Um, and I'll, I'll let you know, you know, it's this one is not as much about tourism. There will be some overlap with tourism. Um, there's some topical issues with tourism. But what we're really looking at today is how outdoor recreation access is a competitive advantage for retaining, recruiting and retaining workers um, as um, Christina Henderson in her report in the Kauffman Foundation called it Montana mystique. Um, it may not be the leading reason why folks come and stay here, but it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue uh, for business recruiting and retaining talent. So um, we'll also be talking about how we how we need to invest in the outdoors because it's not a limitless resource. So we're kind of riding on the back of some of these natural assets and natural amenities. But in reality, as we're gonna f find out from our guests, Erica Lighthizer from the front lines of front country issues in Livingston, Montana, um, why, why investment is critical, why it's key, why it's a draw, why it's key and how communities like Livingston, though Livingston is not the only one, I have to kind of admit, we are all in the front lines of Zoom towns right now. I'm coming out of Whitefish, Marnie's coming out of Big Sky, Erica's coming out of um, you know, uh, Livingston, and Christine is coming out of Missoula. So how do we prepare? So first of all, a, a, what is a Zoom town? Um, basically, I came up with this. It's it's not you know, any kind of um, technical thing, but it's an amenity rich community where remote workers and businesses unfettered from the constraints of the commute in the office are seeking a new life. Some articles have called it permanent vacation um, and with COVID remote work is becoming the norm. Um, in a recent study, 60% of uh, workers are working remotely and two thirds would like to continue to do so. 
So the ones who are looking to, um, to relocate uh, from the city that don't have to commute, don't have to go to the office, um, they are moving. They're moving around uh, to Zoom towns. Um, and Montana is on the map in a big way. And we'll hear that um, from Christina Henderson, who will talk about particularly from the knowledge workers. So the high tech, high tech businesses, how high tech businesses are recruiting for talent because talent is key. Um, our she'll talk about it a little bit, but you know, our universities aren't turning enough out enough folks. We don't have enough population to be able to populate those jobs. Um, and uh, in this, in Bloomberg, when they talked about Zoom towns, you know, they they recognized that first there was a Silicon Valley shift to you know Portland, Denver, Austin, but now you're seeing it in places like Truckee and Missoula. Um, Bloomberg says where virtual work is transforming housing markets and local economies. Oh my gosh, I've got to speed up. Okay, so outdoor recreation access is the magnet. And according, there was a recent article in the Flathead Beacon and I put some pictures in here from, from Missoula, but you know, we have recreation. And as long as people are gonna be able to work from home, it's gonna allow them to work, work where they wanna live, live where they wanna work and play. So there's a recent study I've attached all of these in the resources at the end, so don't worry. You can you can read it at your leisure. But it was uh, called the uh, it was the Journal of, of American Planning, and they did a study of Western Gateway communities, and those are communities that are less than twenty five percent to twenty five thousand population within ten miles of a national park, monument, national forest, lake, or river and at least 15 miles from a census designated urban areas. And you can see all the dots. There are a lot of them. I think they're about 1500 something. Uh, what they did was they took all those towns, they narrowed it down to about 300 and then they interviewed others. Uh, and, and actually Marnie, uh, Whitefish and Big Sky were two of the communities that were interviewed about um, access to outdoor, you know, outdoor amenities. So what they found is, you see all these dots in Montana, these are, um, these are potentially, you know, Zoom towns, but what they're finding is that big city problems meet small towns. So COVID exacerbated this amenity migration that we have. We have already had it. We all know it. We've talked about it for 20 years. We, we know people are moving here for the amenities, but at the rate that people are doing it now, and especially with, um, the fact that remote working has skyrocketed, it's really important for these communities or potentially potential Zoom towns to be planning for, oh, okay, I'm out of time, um, to be planning for, um, for growth. So quickly, um, this is a, um, a map that sort of shows based on a 3% growth rate. Uh, this was in the, the Mountain Journal in an article called a, a Natural Disaster. I attached the link to it at the end. But like, this is what the greater Yellowstone looks like if we, if Bozeman grows to the size of Minneapolis, if the, you know, Teton Valley, Idaho Falls grows and Billings becomes a Boise sized metro. Um, there are impacts uh, to housing. Uh, I was shocked as I did this research, but you know the median price in Bozeman is eight hundred uh, five hundred eighty eighty five thousand, up in October, up from five fifty in September. Columbia Falls is up um, to three thirty six, which is a fifty percent increase from three years ago. The median price for a home in Livingston is three hundred. $45,000. Um, Butte is up by 10%. Uh, it's still affordable. Um, and the Flathead, I don't know if these numbers are really, really right. Uh, the Flathead doesn't track as much as, as some other realtors do. So. so what we're seeing is impacts. We see impacts to outdoor recreation. Um, just for an example, you know, national parks visitation, we've all heard about it. We've read about it. But even just this September, Yellowstone 
was up 21% with 837 visits. Um, we have um, state parks. State parks had record setting visitation. Um, Flathead State Parks, uh, water access up 33.5%. Um, you can read these numbers, 26%. Thompson Chain of Lakes around Libby was up 42.5%. So I put this picture, which is actually a picture of Blankenship Bridge uh, River access on the North Fork. And you can see, I, I mean, you guys have been there, you know, it, there's no amenities, there's no boat ramp, there's no nothing. There's no infrastructure. And folks were just camping out there for a long time um, with extremely significant impacts to the, um, to the area, not the least of which was sanitation. And I will leave it there. Um, just yesterday, New York Times article, pandemic crowds bring river geddon to Montana rivers. Now, this is not the demographic we're talking about people maybe living here. Maybe it's tourism, maybe it's COVID refugees, don't really know. But this kind of parking at a, um, at a trailhead is, uh, is what's happening. Um, these developed places where we can get nature, that's where it's happening. So there's also an impact on, on wildlife and, and wild lands. I will tell you, we could do an entire hour, four hours, eight hours just on this topic. But I, I put this slide in here uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's striking to me. When you look at the um, growth projections for the greater Yellowstone area, uh, population-wise, just some estimates, but you also see how critters move. Um, this is a, a super interesting uh, map from the Wyoming Migration Initiative that shows tracks, elk herds, and where they go. So, um, you know, these elk that we rely on for our outdoor recreation economy, I mean, we rely on them in wild nature. Um, there is a distinct overlap between the uh, urbanizing areas and the places that these critters need to survive. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to our esteemed guests um, to sort of talk about this issue, I'll tell you right now, no one has answers. Um, but I think starting to um, connect the dots, connect each other, connect some of these siloed um, areas, economic development versus tourism versus conservation versus um, community planning, housing infrastructure, um, I think that um, this is a great start to do that. So I'm looking forward to hearing Christina uh, explain what she's seeing from the High Tech Business Alliance perspective and put a little, uh, put a little meat on the bones. Uh, Marnie will talk about that next layer of businesses, not just tech, but businesses that rely on the outdoors directly or indirectly. And then we'll hear from Erica who will um, you know, talk to us from the front lines of, of a town like Livingston that's really facing some of, these, um, some of these challenges and talk about what, you know, what they're trying to do uh, to, to uh, thrive as a community. So with that, um, Christina, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Diane, for having me. <laughs> I represent the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. We're a statewide association of high tech and manufacturing companies all across Montana. Next slide, please. Um, and we have conducted annual high tech industry surveys, uh, both of our member companies, we have uh, more than 230 members all across Montana. Um, and we also include non member tech companies, we've identified more than 600 high tech firms that are operating today. Uh, and in 2019, this industry reached an all time high of $2.5 billion in annual revenue. It's growing nine times the overall economy and pays twice the median wage. So an important and growing sector in Montana's economy. Next slide. 
And we define high tech as companies that make or sell high tech products, provide professional services related to tech, conduct e-commerce, and also are engaged in advanced manufacturing. Next. And within uh, tech, we have identified a number of sub-industries that are substantial in Montana, software, tech consulting, marketing, manufacturing, professional services, and biotech, among others. Next. And our firms are mainly uh, in the college towns. So our two big tech hubs uh, for members and for high tech activity are Bozeman and Missoula. We have a large and glowing, growing, excuse me, second or third region up in the Flathead Valley. Uh, so somewhat aligned with where we're seeing some of the biggest um, uh, challenges with affordable housing and, and some of the outdoor crowding. Um, but we have phenomenal high tech companies operating all across Montana. The great thing about tech is that it's not constrained by natural resources or other local assets. Basically, if you can get good broadband, you can be engaged in this high tech economy. Next slide, please. Um, in our surveys every year for the last six years, uh, the number one benefit cited by tech businesses of doing business in Montana is our quality of life. So our access to the outdoors, all these great amenities, our um, wonderful communities and schools, our quality of life in Montana is our biggest business asset, according to entrepreneurs. And our biggest barrier to growth is access to talent. This has also been top of the list every year. So it's crucial that we're able to continue to attract um, both Montanans back who might've left and also attract new talent to fill some of the uh, hard to fill positions, especially in fields like computer science, as Diane uh, referred to earlier, in some of these fields, we're just not putting out enough college graduates to, to, to fill that demand, not even close. So we have a drastic undersupply of talent in some of these areas. And while we're actively working to reach out to our K-12 education system and our colleges to encourage them to increase our output of students that are going into these high demand fields. It's also crucial to meet the immediate need that we're bringing new people in um, to Montana. Next slide, please. Uh, we see three key trends that are driving the overall growth in Montana's in innovation economy, one technological, one social, and one economic. Next, please. On the technological side, the uh, onset of the internet, of cloud-based computing, has reduced geographic barriers to growth. So a state like Montana is no longer shut off from the global economy. We can participate and grow and scale a business affordably from anywhere in Montana. Next, please. And a great example of this, um, you know, we see tremendous companies cropping up in our rural and tribal communities. iResponse is a tech company in Box Elder on the Rocky Boy Reservation. Um, they are tribally owned and they are using uh, advanced databases and ground penetrating radar to identify um, cultural and religious sites in, on tribal lands so that when folks are, you know, there's development going on, they can identify and work around those sites. Um, and their product is taking off nationally. They have more than a dozen employees. And these are the types of companies that we're able to um, take root, that are able to take root in more rural places because of these trends technologically. Next slide, please. Uh, the next trend is social. So we're seeing a change in the priorities of younger generations where rather than just going where the jobs are, they're going where they want to live and they're valuing work-life balance much more. Um, we've seen research from the economist Richard Florida who studies the migration patterns of the creative class and knowledge workers. So these are people that work in fields like tech and media and the arts. They often go to urban centers, which makes sense. But a footnote to Richard Florida's research is that these knowledge workers also love living in college towns with outdoor amenities, which definitely fits the profile of communities like Missoula and Bozeman that have access to national parks, outdoor recreation. Um, and so that's part of what's fueling the growth in tech. Next slide, please. We also are seeing what's called rural brain grants. 
brain game. So this is some other exciting research out of the University of Minnesota conducted by Ben Winchester. And what they have found is that uh, there's a migration pattern where high school graduates will leave communities to go to the cities to get an education or to get a job. And then they're coming back in their 30s and 40s. Sometimes people who didn't even grow up in that community are moving in in their 30s and 40s because they want a more rural lifestyle. Um, they're bringing into the community their college degrees, their work experience, professional contacts, spending power, and kids uh, to, say, attend the local schools. Um, and they're coming there largely for this, the lifestyle, for a simpler life. They want safety and security. Affordable housing is a huge factor. Um, and they also are coming for outdoor recreation as well as other community assets like schools. And so I think we have a huge opportunity in front of us as we're facing more interest in the state to maybe spread the benefits of the tech growth deeper into our communities who really are needing more economic growth and would love to have these people who are interested in the Montana lifestyle bring those assets into their communities. Next slide, please. A great example of this is Spica Design and Manufacturing in Lewistown, Montana. Tom Spica founded this company. He was a, a farmer who ended up building a welding business that's grown to more than 75 employees. Um, and when Tom started his business, what he maybe didn't foresee was that his two daughters, Katie and Becky, would graduate from college and later moved back to Lewistown to help him run the company. Um, Katie Spica was uh, a few years ago named the new CEO. So this is now a family owned women led business in Lewistown that's benefiting from this sort of migration back or the brain gain that can happen in rural communities. Next slide, please. And the last trend that we see is economics. So we, as a high tech industry have had huge successes in the last decade. The most, the largest to date is the sale of right now technology, technologies to Oracle in 2012 for $1.8 billion. Um, that company and that whole ecosystem of companies around Bozeman is part of what's helping to drive the tremendous growth in Gallatin County. And we also have a strong entrepreneurial ecosystem across the state. A lot of those entrepreneurs um, or the, the workers from right now technologies have stayed in Montana because they love the life here. They have no desire to leave and they're investing their knowledge and assets into the next generation of startups. Next slide, please. Uh, one example is a phenomenal Montana-grown company called Onyx Maps out of Missoula. Eric Siegfried founded this company when he was in his mid-20s, right out of college, uh, graduated from MSU, moved to Missoula, and he took a $500 investment, decided to build a company on the internet that's devoted to outdoor recreation. So he was a backcountry hunting guide, realized that it was a challenge to know who owned the land that he was standing on. So he took publicly available GIS data and land ownership data and combined it into a chip that you could plug into a Garmin. This product became wildly popular. And then as folks shifted to using uh, mobile devices, they developed a mobile app that does the same thing. And they kept growing until in 2018, they received $20 million in venture capital investment from outside the state. They hired a new CEO, Laura Orvitas, who's a veteran of Amazon. And they are continuing to grow wildly, actually, during this COVID pandemic, as people are trying to get out into the backcountry and into the woods and to find new trails that um, where there are not a million people, um, they're able to use Onyx Maps technology to do this. And the founders and the leadership of this company has said this is the type of a company that could never have been built anywhere but Montana because their culture and their ethic is so closely connected to the outdoors. Next slide, please. Um, so that's my the, the end of my presentation, but um, I look forward to conversation at the end. Thank you. Thank you, um, Christina. I, I have to say as a um, member of for, uh, member of uh, Montana High Tech Alliance through my uh, former law practice, um, Christina is just such a talented leader and has been able to take this business itself from nothing 
uh, an idea into really a go-to place that really provides value for high-tech businesses, elevating the discussion and making the connections that she's making between business and um, outdoor recreation and technology. So thank you, Christina. Thank you, Diane. Yes, I have uh, enjoyed watching the trajectory of Christina's business uh, and her leadership in this space. So um, I now uh, will turn it over to, to Marnie, who I have also admired for years and years and years, um, it, making the connection between um, businesses that rely on, on outdoor recreation but making it, making it real and making, making a difference, moving the needle. So um, not just talking about the importance, but actually working to ensure, as she says in her slide, that the assets are available for, for the future. So uh, future businesses, future people, future kids, and et cetera. So um, Marnie, I'm gonna turn it over to you now um, to talk about um, economic growth and outdoor recreation. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I love that I get to follow Christina because she spoke to um, a lot of what is sort of an underlying theme here that, you know, the connection between the outdoors and business goes beyond recreation and tourism. Um, and I love I love that the tech sector intersects where, where we do our work at Business for Montana's Outdoors and Christina and I have done work in the past and I feel like it's a good segue. Um, so Diane, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. And if our pre-call yesterday was any indication, clearly uh, this, this group and I'm sure beyond the speakers um, have a lot to contribute um, to this discussion about how Montana's communities are becoming Zoom towns with all the challenges and opportunities that come along with that. And um, I love the platform that this group has brought together for that discussion. So um, the more I think about these ideas and the more that we've sort of talked about it, you know, this, this first slide and the title of my presentation feels, um, I'm not sure it feels appropriate or maybe it's better to say that it's appropriate, but it feels risky to say that our outdoors are currency, especially in the lens that we're talking about them today, because at what cost, literally and figuratively, does that come? Um, next slide. So I, I like to start with this slide. Um, it's a quote that I've used before in presentations. Some people might have seen it, um, <clears throat> but I really think it just kind of nails the idea of what we're talking about here, that our lifestyle and our access to these wild and adventurous places and our communities that fill the spaces of character here in Montana um, are really a significant draw to businesses. And also, beyond that, how it is essential that we consider how we're taking care of those assets and how we're really uh, putting them in a place uh, for success and sustainability. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to just give a really brief background of Business for Montana's Outdoors. I'm hoping that BFMO is not totally new to a lot of people who might be listening in today. Um, if so, this will kind of just give a, a little bit of a framework of how we operate. So BFMO is really sort of um, giving a space for a larger spectrum of businesses to get in on the conversation about how we protect our outdoors. So we have provided this sort of broad industry perspective to the economic advantages of public of lands, um, how they're critical to attracting business. Obviously, Christina spoke a lot to that, creating jobs, supporting communities, both in our um, urban and rural centric areas and creating this value around our outdoor amenities. Um, we advocate for these economic advantages, um, how they really present themselves as um, you know, a benefit to business across the state. We, we will we hear these numbers a lot. It won't be the last time in this presentation they get talked about, but you know, historically our outdoor recreation economy supports you know, $7 billion in our economy, 71,000 jobs and an influx of roughly 287 million through taxes. Um, you know, using Business for Montana's Outdoors platform, we leverage this mainstream emerging industry um, business sector to sort of bring that into the discussion of our outdoor economy, sort of the why of businesses choosing to be in Montana. Um, and again, across 
you know, out, outside of the usual suspects of outfitting and recreation and tourism, which obviously bring huge value, but also um, the, the sort of ends of the spectrum of technology, software, healthcare, as Diane mentioned, um, important piece, engineering, manufacturing, research, um, they all play a role. Next slide. And then just reiterating kind of who we are and what we do and really putting that emphasis on expanding this conversation to include um, the benefits beyond what just tourism brings. So we're talking about expanding tech and manufacturing. Um, we're talking about expanding opportunities into rural communities who have the potential to really diversify our geographic centers. So we try, we try at BFMO to, to create a sort of industry and geographic diverse roster to leverage what our outdoors can do for business and economic growth in Montana. So it's really a grassroots effort to engage businesses, um, focusing on, again, this outdoor lifestyle amenity and the economic values of our outdoors, um, creating a way to invite businesses and jobs and economic development into the discussion of public lands protection and advocacy. Because in addition to just sort of creating this really nice group of businesses who um, message strongly about the value of the outdoors, what we intend to do and what we hope we will keep making strides on is really moving the needle on these policies and the programs that protect all these places that we're talking about. Um, today we are able to leverage 225 businesses that are members of BFMO um, and collectively they provide um, close to 4,600 jobs in Montana. Next slide. Uh, so Diane had asked that I um, bring together some trends. Um, she has shared some numbers, Christina shared some numbers. I'm sure Erica will have her own set of data that she would like to share as well. But essentially what we're all showing is that um, the trend in businesses coming to Montana as a result of our outdoor opportunities is relevant and it's obviously growing, especially, um, especially now in the face of COVID. So you can see from some of these quick data snapshots that outdoor recreation is obviously um, significant uh, to, and a driver of our economy, not only from a recreation and tourism standpoint, but these numbers um, reflect what is supported by our outdoor rec industry. Um, what we don't see, what's often harder to quantify, is how many businesses of different industries are coming here to capture this, the lifestyle, the amenities, um, and then using that as a tool to attract and retain talent, to bring talent from other places and other companies to Montana. Um, this first report that's listed on this slide is uh, one that the Out Office of Outdoor Recreation pulled together um, talking about the key, you know, our outdoor recreation as a key component to our state's economic leverage. Again, looking at numbers of, you know, how much, how many billions of dollars are supported in the economy through outdoor rec, how much money in wages, how many jobs. Um, I, I like the bullet point about how much of our GDP is um, contributed to by our outdoor recreation economy. $2.4 billion of our state's economy comes um, fr uh, from the outdoor rec economy, 5.1% of our GDP. That in, I think this number is from 2019, um, that put us at number three in the country for, for highest GDP relative to our outdoor recreation, I think, or maybe second, only behind Hawaii. Um, in that study, also, it shows us that 96% of Montana residents believe outdoor recreation is important to our economic future, um, and that 10% of our jobs uh, do come from the outdoor rec industry, um, you know, competitively right up there with manufacturing and, and construction. Next slide. Um, again, just kind of sharing some more of this data, um, looking at uh, this 2017 report that was put together um, talking about how federal public lands help attract people, investment and business. Again, this is nothing new or surprising um, for this conversation or probably not to many people on this, on this webinar. Um, but as our economy diversifies, um, these federal public lands become an even increasingly important attractant for business um, and the people that, that are contributing to our state's economic future. And as we're talking about today, you know, that it's really gonna become more of a significant piece of not how are we using 
or not using? How are our outdoor assets bringing um, growth into our state, but how are we, we protecting and being good stewards of these assets as that growth happens? And then just a couple of different snapshots of, of time in the 2000s that shows um, how many new jobs were created um, over nearly a decade. And then again, um, how many tourism uh, and travel-based jobs were created as well. Next slide. Um, this outdoor recreation economy report is uh, one that the Outdoor Industry Association does not every year. Again, this one's a few years old. Um, and again, is just talking about nationally what we're seeing in terms of outdoor recreation contributing to economies. Um, and then also um, in Montana, what some of those specific numbers are. Um, again, in the billions of dollars of wages, in the hundreds of millions of dollars in state and local taxes. Um, how much we participate as Montanans in outdoor recreation and what that um, spending looks like in terms of comparisons to other expenditures by Montanans in an annual on an annual basis. You know, this is obviously not a, a full comprehensive list of research and I'm sure that there are other compelling numbers out there. Um, Headwaters Economics has done some additional and more recent really compelling research about in-migration numbers, what kind of job growth, per capita income growth, and all around sort of value proposition our protected lands bring to us. Um, and we see, uh, you know, what we see that rises to the top in a lot of this research is that Montana is a place that businesses want to be. Christina, again, referred to that. Um, and that's not a surprise. Um, in a survey that we did, a Business for Montana's Outdoors reached out to um, businesses in every county in the state. And 70% of the businesses that we talked to cited the outdoor lifestyle, recreation, access, wildlife, all of that, um, public lands, as a significant factor um, in their decision to bring or do business in Montana. So that, you know, for us equates to what kind of work are we then putting into protecting these places and making sure that we're not just talking about how wonderful all of our recreation is. And um, in fact, we're actually doing something to, to, to make a difference in how it is sustainable. Next slide. Um, I've always liked this slide. I think it just really spells out that there are a lot of facets to the value of our public lands. It's not just recreation. It's not agriculture only or commodities or heritage or economic development. And we all tend to sort of pick one of these things and really talk about it, that it means the most or it makes this much of an impact over the other. And it's, it's all of it. Um, our public lands really sort of create this necessary symbiotic relationship that's essential in Montana. And I think that this um, not only shows where all the value of the public lands are, but really what is also at risk of being threatened if we um, sort of continue on this hyperspeed trajectory of, of influx of, of business in our communities and, and are not really looking at what the um, impacts of that could be down the line. Uh, next slide. Um, and this, I don't need to run through all these bullet points. Um, I think we, we have talked about a lot of these and we will talk more about it throughout this conversation, but I just feel like it really reiterates, reiterates everything we're covering today. Um, generally emphasizing how we protect, invest and nurture our outdoors um, for all the assets and trends we're talking about for recreation, for wildlife migration, for business development, community growth, and also in rural communities, preservation of heritage, all of it. Um, you know, recruiting businesses, leveraging businesses, um, commissioning good research, building relationships with our elected officials, um, engaging businesses in publicity opportunities, um, taking advantage of public platforms like this. I think these are all opportunities um, that we really need to take advantage of to um, shine the light on. Yes, th these are all wonderful things and, and assets that we use in to some degree, but we also need to protect them. And I think the biggest challenge that we face now um, that we're experiencing in this kind of elevated and fast-tracked interest in where we live is to figure out how not to let it become exploited um, as a commodity. And I think we're all very, very good at touting our superior outdoors and our recreation. And that's why we're all here. Um, that's maybe what brought us here. That's maybe what kept us here. Um, but I think what we now need to do in pooling our resources and our talents and all of our um, 
interest is to figure out how we protect it. So I think the last slide is just how to find business for Montana's outdoors if you're more interested in what we do and if you'd like to add your voice. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marnie. Um, just so you know, um, we have, I have included most of these um, resources in the, uh, in the resource section of, of the slides, but I think um, because Christina, you referenced a couple of surveys that folks might be interested in, um, and Marnie, you may have something too. Um, we'll, I'll make sure that they're included uh, on the, not only on this webinar, but also on the website as resources. Um, so thank you. Um, now, you know, we're going to turn from theory into reality um, and big picture to, to on the ground. Um, and I'm going to welcome Erica, who's the epitome of Zoom towning right now. Um, participating uh, mobily and living her best life um, uh, out of, uh, you know, using technology um, and enjoying the outdoors. Um, I think, you know, part of the reason that we have um, developed this series is to, to spotlight some of the challenges and opportunities that rural communities have. So we hear about Bozeman, we hear about Whitefish, we hear about, um, you know, we hear about Billings, but, um, but we don't often hear from, from some of the rural communities that have amazing assets, a desire for, um, econ you know, economic growth, but also um, some like Livingston that are getting uh, rapidly changing, um, and a lot of it has to do with um, outdoor recreation infrastructure. I, I wouldn't use that term like with regular people, but with this crowd, I'm going to call it like it is. Um, these places that we cherish usually have trailheads, they usually have a place to park, they usually have some kind of facilities, maybe a boat ramp, maybe um, maybe a, a trail, a built trail um, a, of some sort. So that kind of front lines of, of front country, the places that people go every day, that families, uh, tech workers take their kids, take their dogs um, every day, not just going in the back country, but the places that they can get nature and get a nature fix every day is, um, is what I think um, one of the challenges and opportunities is for, for a place like Livingston. So Erica, um, Erica is on the State Parks and Recreation Board as, as I was and um, is really looking at developed front country recreation. Um, you know, state parks are clearly anchors for um, communities and uh, fishing access sites and sites that are built and administered by the state. So um, Erica, take it away. Thank you. Hi all, um, and thank you, Diane, Christina, Marnie. You're all really hard acts to follow who for sharing so much data so I can kind of focus on the stories. I'm gonna take this big picture conversation and kind of bring it down to the ground at a local level and Livingston share a few of the realities of this phenomenon and what we're doing locally about it. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So a little bit about me. Again, my name is Erica Lighthizer. I'm the deputy director at Park County Environmental Council. Today I'm zooming to you all from the Mojave Desert. Um, we're on the land of the Kuwasu, the Kitanemuk, the Serrano, the Koso, and several tribes of the, the Southern Paiute. My family is on a multi-week trip exploring some public lands and parks in the desert Southwest. And part of our journey, we're trying to learn a little bit more about the tribes and the people who came before us on these lands. You know, people that honestly, we have a lot to learn from. They're true conservationists who use the land um, and resources very sustainably for many generations. Um, these are my three kiddos. 
Um, we're at, nat at this in this picture, we're at the Natural Bridges National Monument about a week ago. I think we've you know, done a lot of talking about uh, public lands in terms of recreation, heritage and economy. Um, I also like to think about public lands as teachers, um, the cultural history, the natural history. There's just so much to learn out there. So this has been a really cool trip where we've learned a lot about our land. So uh, next slide. Uh, about Park County Environmental Council, we're a community conservation organization based in Livingston, just north of Yellowstone National Park. Our mission is to safeguard the land, water, wildlife, and people of Yellowstone's Northern Gateway. Next slide. Oh, did I, did you, are you guys hearing me? Okay, oh, okay. Um, so we work at a local level, but often our initiatives have a national importance. Um, we defended our community and land from gold mines, oil and gas, tire pits, asphalt plants. There's been a lot of really bad ideas <laughs> that have come about in our community and our organization has done a lot over the last 30 years to protect the land in, in the way we experience it today. Um, a lot of our work, um, we've always been focused on planning, but as, a, um, as of recently, it, we've really doubled down. It's become a huge focus of our work. And um, as one community member put it, we need to stop playing whack-a-mole with these industrial uh, issues and really start to get proactive. So we've been focused on that at both the city and county level working on growth policies and uh, trying to really um, prepare our community for the future. Um, why don't you go to the next slide? It's a little different. Oh, okay. So this is a picture of, Sec the slides are a little bit out of order. This, this is a picture of Secretary Zinke signing um, a 20 year mineral withdrawal where we um, uh, prevented, uh, there we, prevented uh, large-scale mining on 30,000 acres of public land um, just outside of Paradise Valley. Um, why don't you go to the next slide? Is it coming through? There we go. There's Livingston. So what do you think about when you think about Livingston? The wind? the Yellowstone River, the cool historic downtown. We're definitely a community with a lot of characters and character is really important to us. Um, we have a lot of pride in our uniqueness as a community. Although a lot of folks do go to Bozeman for work, um, we're not a bedroom community. And, and that's really important to emphasize. Um, affordable housing is a really big issue in Livingston and there's a lot of disparity and economic inequality. Um, being next to Yellowstone and in a county where we have some 55% public lands, you know, we definitely see a lot of tourism seasonally um, and we um, really rely on that. Um, we're also kind of a under-resourced community in that you know, we are a gateway community, but we don't have a gateway tax. So investment in our community and these spaces has always been a challenge and will definitely continue to be so as, a, uh, as this pandemic and um, these current trends suggest. One of the things I really love about Livingston though is, is really the generosity. The, 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 it's just such a kind and engaged community. People really care and wanna be a part of the solution. So next slide. Oh. And I think you might need to skip ahead two slides. It's slow on my end. I apologize for uh, the delay. Okay, so next slide. What we're seeing, meat pandemic. Um, the sand is really kind of shifting beneath our feet with this, um, with this pandemic. Um, as Diane and others suggested, you know, national park gateway towns like Livingston, where you're 
you're not sequestered in your home. You can get outside and enjoy. You know, we're really seeing people show up in unprecedented numbers. You know, visitation in Yellowstone was setting records. Um, you know, the, you saw the New York Times article that described our river accesses as River Geddon. You know, I wish I had taken some pictures of some of the fishing access sites this summer. It was just unbelievable. Um, cars everywhere, uh, you know, packing out the parking lots, up and down the roadways. It, I mean, people were really getting out in um, unprecedented ways. And um, let's see. And, you know, we really have seen a, a huge increase in real estate, you know, the real estate trends are also really kind of alarming. Um, as Diane said, in Livingston, now the median house price is around 350,000. Um, my family was looking for a house in April. So we were watching prices and saw um, anecdotally a price of a two bedroom, one bath house from last fall to this summer go up some 75 to $100,000. It was really alarming. And for a community that already has issues with um, housing security and affordable housing, um, it's really creating a, a squeeze that's, that's um, gonna need to be addressed and we're gonna really have to be thinking about. So let's um, advance slides here. Okay, I apologize for the delay. I already talked about that one. If we could go to the one that says challenges. So the challenges we're seeing, um, really the plans and policies are uh, desperately behind. Um, we don't have the zoning, the rules or signage. You know, we have a lot um, to, really um, that we really need to put in place. Um, you know, with more people in the backcountry than ever before, with increasing co housing costs, um, you know, it's just, it's a really challenging time. Oh yeah, and if anybody's been outside this summer, it seems like there's tons more poop out there in the woods. <laughs> It's no joke, but it's really, uh, it's been, people are out in unprecedented ways. So if you could switch to the opportunity slide. So I, I really want folks to, I mean, it's really easy to get really hyperbolic about, um, about the issues. I want to be careful that I think there are some tremendous opportunities as a result of new people with energy and fresh ideas coming to our communities. Um, you know, just anecdotally, what, what I've seen, I've talked to a number of people who've moved to Livingston um, in the last few months. Uh, there seems to be an acute focus on, with these folks on equity. They're moving here because they, they love it. They, they really, they love the public lands. They love the access to the outdoors. And they seem to be willing to be engaged. Um, and I think the Zoom phenomenon is making it easier. Um, I recently attended a city planning board meeting where we had something like 60 participants. I mean, in the, in the old days, you know, there might be three people that, that stick it out for the three hour meeting that goes to 10 p.m. on a weeknight. I mean, it's really making um, engagement more accessible. And I, so I think there's some real positives there. I think there's also, with this pandemic, there's also an agreement on the issues. Um, I think people are identifying housing as, a, uh, as an issue and a challenge. They're identifying that, you know, um, there's issues with overuse in our recreation spaces. So I think, you know, the first step to solving a problem is to really identify that problem. And so, it's that's that's one positive opportunity I see. So, um, if you could go to the current focus slide. So back to kind of what PCC's current focus is, we're really focused on planning in a huge way. 
Um, right now we're working with the city of Livingston on updating their growth policy. And we've really seen some tremendous engagement throughout that process. Um, the consultant that's been helping with draft the growth policy said, you know, we, we haven't seen this kind of engagement for communities of any size, much less as, as uh, a town as small as Livingston. So we're really seeing great engagement and we're focusing on increasing that, not only at the city level, but at the county level in the um, in parks and recreation boards, and, or I'm sorry, in, the, in parks and recreation space as well. And we're out there collecting data. Um, you know, one of the things we've done in the last couple of months is go out and uh, do bike audits. We want to learn about the walkability and bikeability of our neighborhood so we can inform our growth policy with that data. We're also uh, collecting recreational use data on the river. Um, we need that data and, and it's, it's been a tremendous learning experience to get out there listen, get on the ground and, and collect that data. So what do I think is needed? If you wanna to go to the next slide. I really think it's all of us. Um, we need to be focusing on planning at a lot of levels, the city, the county, the forest, parks. Um, there's so many levels that planning um, we need to be focused on. And no one group has all the answers. So, you know, what I've seen really work is a coalition of entities, businesses, tourism, agriculture, land management agencies, municipalities, nonprofits. We need to be working together collectively to um, tackle these issues and problems. Um, I think we need access to more data. Um, we need strong strategic visioning. And, you know, we really need to be asking ourselves the hard questions. But this takes time. You know, a lot of the groups that are working on issues like this are traditionally siloed, are traditionally um, not talking together. And in order to have that collaborative approach, um, the it takes that time and that trust, or we need to build that trust over time. Um, next slide. Oh, one more. Thanks. But the really good news is it's happening. Uh, it's happening here at a local level. When I was originally thinking about what I'd include in this presentation, I thought to look elsewhere in Sedona, Arizona, in Gunnison, Colorado, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, these areas are, you know, they're good examples to look at. Um, they're definitely planning for the future and recreation and sustainable tourism. But there's a lot happening here right in our backyard. Um, our local Park County Community Foundation took the reins recently and launched a series of information gatherings and meetings on housing. Um, this included representation from a ton of different people. And now that's evolving into a working group where they can really um, take those recommendations and what they learn to, to kind of the next level. At PCEC, we've really um, taken a nod from that uh, collaborative approach with the Housing Coalition and we're launching community conversations to talk about different aspects of planning. Um, so community members are aware of the tools they have available to address growth and change in our community. Um, for the last couple of years, I've been able to be involved in um, the Crazy Mountain Working Group, which also involves a really diverse set of stakeholders, landowners, land management agencies, conservationists, sportsmen, and we're all looking, working together to, to try to address the issues around access in the Crazy Mountains. And also really exciting, um, the Upper Yellowstone Watershed Group is really taking the lead on protecting the Yellowstone River um, through drought planning and recreation studies, weed management. They, they've initiated a number of things to um, really begin to look at um, recreation use and overuse on our river. And that also involves a really diverse group of stakeholders. 
Um, actually, when I sent out the information about this meeting here last night, I got a awesome uh, group of uh, emails that kind of blew up <laughs> my inbox um, that shared all kinds of data that they, they're just starting to get in the data from the recreation use studies on the Yellowstone this summer. And so there was some staggering uh, figures like 92 uh, vehicles at Carter's Bridge on one day in August. It, it's really interesting stuff that we really need to um, to be taken further here. Erica? Oh, thank yep, you. I'm almost done. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I realize I'm out of time. And then um, just lastly, you know, like one of the, um, what's sort of the secret sauce? Like I, I think they're um, a group that has uh, a diversity of folks with a lot of backgrounds um, and a lot of different ideas coming together. This is how we're gonna tackle these issues. And I hope today, this is just a conversation starter. We can um, continue to have these conversations in the future and because uh, this is gonna be a big issue and I appreciate you creating the forum to be able to talk about this, Diane. Thank you. Erica, I, I knew this was going to be the problem. I mean, I knew it. It's we had scheduled a 15 minute phone call just to meet each other. And we were on the phone for 45 minutes because it's fat. It's it's fascinating balance of opportunity challenges and um, and just the lightning speed changes um, that are going on combined with the glacial changes of um you know of our of our mountains and rivers so um I, I i mean we'll have another one we'll have another one on the collaboratives we'll have another one on um you know how we empower r more rural communities outside the the hot spots um to engage remote working um and and figure out like what that really looks like so uh, we're out of time. Um, I want to share a few things. We've got some questions. Uh, I'm going to run through this super quick. I'll put it on the website too. But um, just as a reminder, the application for some of these uh, funding sources, RTP, LWCF, and the new Montana Trail Stewardship, the grant is, is open. It opened November 2nd. The tourism grants, everyone's probably madly writing their tourism grants right now, but the, app, the period ends on the 30th. Our upcoming webinars are kind of exciting too, because I have people know I'm like a front country fanatic. Um, on December 8th, we're going to hear from um, Lincoln, Montana. So front lines of Lincoln. And um, we'll have the USDA that is really kind of rebundling and repackaging some of their programs to facilitate um, the a rural outdoor recreation economy. Uh, it's kind of exciting. Um, and then on December 15th, we're going to hear from Shoto and how Shoto put outdoor recreation at the center of its, its economic um, development using a uh, facilitated process through, through MEDA, which is a Montana Outdoor uh, Environmental Develop Development Association. Um, so, you know, all different ways to kind of get at the same nut, but, um, but we're going to look at all of them so, because we have to. Um, okay, so here are some resources. I mean, I put articles, I put um, some, uh, you know, Butte as an emerging uh, place for, for tech business, um, Montana Mystique, which is a, um, oh shoot, I've got a typo in there, Coffin Foundation, um, which studies entrepreneurship um, around the country. Um, I, think, I, I think that's your study, Marnie, the value of Montana um, outdoors. You can click on that. Um, and then resources, including the New York Times article, which calls it River Geddon, um, another um, Mountain Journal article, which um, coined the term River Geddon, which is too many people on the rivers um, and fisheries. And I also included, just so you can see the um, Q3, visitation report for Montana State Parks for that. Um, um, contact, I put your links in here. Um, I'm sure any, any, all of these, I'm gonna speak for, for everyone here, um, would welcome your comments and feedback. If you wanna be on the list to get 
notices of, of uh, future webinars and all things Front Country Recreation um, sign up. And um, okay, now I'm going to the chats. If you got, can you guys stay a few minutes um, to, to maybe look at some of these questions? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, okay, uh, let's see. Russ Fletcher is asking, um, uh, he is referencing the, the New York Times article, um, which <laughs> it's behind a paywall, but I would really recommend that you read it. Um, the, the byline is, as urbanites flock to forests and rivers to escape coronavirus threat, trailheads are cramped with parked cars and fishing on the Madison River is like a Disneyland ride. Um, in the words of one author, the rivers are getting the living snot pounded out of them every day. So um, that is on the, uh, um, that's in the chat box. You can, can click on that link. I'll include that too. Um, let's see. Um, thank you for, let's see. Um, Okay, so data analytics, um, Erica, it's uh, a message for you, um, data analytics about marketing. Um, and there's a thank you to the Upper Yellowstone Watershed Group, uh, Jeff Reed and um, Max Hortzberg. So um, more comments, questions, you can read those. Um, and again, they'll be um, included in the recording. Um, Let's see. Okay, one of, oh, I see. Yeah. What are you see? Let's see. What are you? What are you seeing as um, the biggest obstacles to attra attracting high tech remote work, other in other great communities beyond the hotspots? Um, Christine, you want to take that one, and Marnie, you want to? Sure. Yeah, and because I saw we were running out of time, I was trying to answer people's questions that were tech related uh, in the chat too. So there are some answers written there. But I will say this is very important to us um, from the outset. Part of the vision that was cast by our founding board was that our our tech community is truly statewide, and that we would not just focus on um, our major handful of tech hubs, but that we would truly reach out into diverse communities and rural and tribal communities. Um, we started a recent article series, Diane posted the Butte article out of that series in the resources, but we're going alphabetically through all of the population centers in Montana um, and just highlighting why they're great communities for tech. And so what this will allow us to do is to highlight some communities that maybe don't get, people don't think of immediately related to tech like Butte or Helena or Great Falls. One of the trends that we're seeing is that more people in the uh, like Missoula and Bozeman that are struggling with affordable housing and, um, and other challenges are moving into those other communities because they have more affordable housing opportunities. They can buy a, a house with a big yard instead of just a condo and those sorts of things. So I think that we'll see more, um, more of a push for, for um, growth in those uh, communities that maybe have more opportunity that could be maximized. Um, and then also we're seeing um, rural and, and tribal communities take off too. And the remote work really lends itself well to uh, bringing back Montanans who may have left um, to some of the research that I pointed to. And a lot of these folks are, are from Montana already. Uh, one of the questions that was asked in the chat too was about, um, you know, if we're bringing in outsiders, what are we doing to help them understand the need for stewardship and investment in the community? Um, our members or our, the tech companies that we survey, 75% of the jobs that they fill are filled with Montanans. So the majority of folks coming in for tech already are from here and maybe understand the ethics. And then, you know, we've been really privileged to work with Marnie and Diane and other groups to um, emphasize the importance of, of outdoor recreation to our, our culture and our values and what's attractive about Montana. And I think with some of these recent, uh, the recent influx due to COVID, we have an opportunity to, um, to maybe do more 
to specifically to, to speak out about um, preserving our heritage and making sure that we're um, that we do both, that we can have growth and high paying jobs in our economy and also preserve the wilderness areas that we all love. Thank you. Um, I want to add, um, I, I'm seeing this message from, <laughs> from Russ Fletcher, but I'm, I'm already on the same page with him. You know, what we've looked at is a slice of <coughs> what makes rural, rural communities successful in recruiting and retaining businesses and talent. But other, um, other issues are broadband. I mean, clearly access to broadband is a gatekeeper for um, the ability for remote workers to work and um, businesses to locate in areas, especially when they're um, in, engaging remote workers or working, working globally. So that's a key. And you know what, another thing that um, I was talking with Shoto is childcare. Childcare and um, lack of access to quality, affordable childcare in some of these communities is a huge, it's a huge barrier. And um, so I think that, um, I, I think that, you know, access to broadband is just sort of a non-starter um, in terms of negotiating, because if you don't have it, it will not happen. So, um, uh, boy, there are a bunch of chats. Russ Fletcher is inviting everyone to join the Mita Broadband Improvement. Thank you, Russ. Um, Y'all check the chats because um, if you do want to to have follow up and follow up on on staying engaged with these issues, um, you know, let's just let's just keep the dialogue going. Um, also, I've set up a private group a private group called uh, Montana Recreation. Alliance, uh, for, excuse me, Front Country Recreation Alliance. And just as a way to sort of keep this conversation going, you know, among ourselves, like who do you use to do strategic planning? Here's an announcement for the broadband um, committee. Like what, if, if things are coming up, um, that would be great. And Christina, I would love to stay engaged with you uh, as you're doing your assessments of these rural communities. So, um, uh, I, you know, it's it's just such a, a hot topic and um, on the front of all of our minds with amazing opportunity um, and, and amazing challenges, frankly. But um, Diane, can I yeah. just can I just answer? And I want I just like take a minute at least to acknowledge and thank the question. But there was one question in the chat that we didn't um, get to, and it's probably would take a full other hour to talk about. But I just wanted to acknowledge it. And the question says. Does anyone on the panel foresee obstacles of applying a purely economic lens to protect, invest in, and nurture natural assets? Um, meaning that are we not doing <clears throat> all of those things in all the same effort to protect places that we aren't talking about that they have an economic value? And I, I guess my only point to that is that in my experience and the work that we've done, it's not just protecting the places that have economic value, but it's showing that you know these places that we have taken for granted to some degree um, do have an inherent value beyond recreation and beyond heritage. So I, I think that like sometimes the people that make decisions for our public lands um, respond differently to an economic discussion about the places we're talking about. I don't think it means for me, it doesn't um, mean that we aren't putting the same effort into protecting places that we don't say have an economic value. I think it would be hard to find a, a, a piece of public land, forest, river, park that we couldn't say had some value of human experience. Um, so that's not an answer, but I just wanted to acknowledge the question and say, you're exactly right. Um, it's not just about the places that bring economic overturn, it's um, that all of the places pieced together have great value to the state. So for what it's worth. Someone else might have a different opinion or input. No, thank you, Marnie. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I could just read the chats. There was a great discussion going on in the chats um, about um, you know the role in protecting public lands, what public lands means, and truthfully, um, I, I think part of what I wanted to emphasize with this discussion was investment and. Um, you know, we heard from Erica about how 
the parking lots were packed, 92 cars in a parking lot. It's probably built, I don't know how many is built for 30. I don't know. I mean, you look at the New York Times article, we've all seen it, um, especially if you live in, in Bozeman, you know, or Missoula, but um, those front country spaces and state parks are getting, well, someone said the living snot beat out of them, but um, I, I don't know if I'd say that, but um, but I just did. So um, the, um, I just think we need to keep talking about it. I think it's um, that investment in our natural assets, um, not just for an economic return, but for all of the variety of, of returns that um, that they value, clean water, wildlife, few sheds, um, et cetera. So um, I don't know, Do, does any, is anyone else monitoring the chats and wanna chat about anything else? Because otherwise I think we can maybe wrap it up and um, if, fo if folks have ideas for future topics, um, just send me an email. Um, I think there are a lot of discussions to be had and, and this is a, a kind of a good way to do it since we can't really get together. Um, I'm a bit sad that Brian Kahn, who sort of spearheaded this, uh, Brian Kahn, who was a, a, a environmental leader and uh, a leader in civil dialogue uh, is no longer with us, but he, he used to have a great show called uh, Common Ground that he would, um, I think that was the name of it. Anyway, he would have really super thoughtful discussions with folks on uh, topics of the day. So we're gonna have to pick up the torch and do it another way. So thank you and we'll end it up. Thank bye bye. You, Diane. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Erica. Thank you. Enjoy the Thank day. You. <clears throat>